today we're looking at the second theme of Lent, which is being called by name. So I want to read a Bible passage from Isaiah 43, verses 5 to 7, that it frames what we're going to talk about today. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. My name is Digby Wilkinson, and my name has great meaning, but it has meaning because of my experience in life. When Isaiah wrote these words, or spoke these words, he was speaking to a group of people whose world was being completely changed. The Babylonians had invaded Jerusalem, and the world was not going to be the same anymore. And he says to them, the God who loves you, he has called all of you by name. He is the one who gives you a sense of meaning. So knowing who you are makes a big difference in terms of our ability to live the life that we've been called to. My name Digby is an unusual name. It's good because whenever I tell people that name, they always rem remember it. They can discern me from Peter and John and Paul and other names. But it has an interesting history because it's not actually my real name. I was given the name Lloyd Kenneth at my birth because my father was a seaman and I was born while he was away and the family determined that Digby, which is the name he wanted to call me, was completely inappropriate. So they called me Lloyd Wilkinson instead. Upon my father's return from overseas, he just called me Digby and it stuck basically for the rest of my life. In fact, it's so stuck I hardly ever respond to the name Lloyd. But Digby has a meaning, as does Lloyd. Lloyd comes from the Welsh word cloed, and it simply means grey. So it's not a particularly good name in that regard. But Digby, however, comes from a farming term, and it means ditch by the farm. So it's hardly a name that you get excited about either. But I've lived with these names all my life, and they have meaning for me. But really the central meaning of my name for me personally is about the life that I've actually lived. It reminds me of who I am and the experiences I've had. And depending on those experiences and the relationships that have come with them, my name can either mean good things or difficult things for me. So we all have names. Some of them are built in etymology and they have specific meanings. But some of them, of course, if you come from Europe, mean that they come from our work background. People who are called carter uh, came from a family who were builders of carts wheelers built wheels, so on and so forth. Or if you're a smith, which is a very common name, you're probably related to a blacksmith of many generations ago. But we're all called by God, and God calls us through the familiar, which is usually the old name that we have, Digby or Joan or James or Duncan or whatever the case may be. And we all live with those names through experience, and God calls us from within that experience itself. God called people throughout the Old Testament, and he called them by their names. Abram, Jacob, Isaiah, Samuel, and all these people came to God because he referred to them, but within their experience of the time. And all those names had meaning. Some of them were good, some of them were bad. If you look up some of the old names from Genesis, you'll come across Bilhar, for example, which means old and confused, or from Exodus, Mara, which means bitter. And they're not names that we always necessarily want to live with, but they frame our experience, if you like. Because when you get called, God calls you from one experience, but he's also calling you to a new experience, calling you from the familiar and moving you into a new place. So many of the people in the Old Testament were given new names. Chief among them, of course, was Abram and Sarai. Abram, his original name, just meant simply great, a father figure, a person of importance. And Sarai actually meant a difficult person, someone who was contentious. But the new name they're given for this new history that they're about to build is different. Abram means the father of generations, and Sarah went on to mean princess, or in the line of greatness. So in that sense, the name change meant a new story was about to be born. When you get called, sometimes there is a new name given, and that was certainly the case in the scriptures as we read them. When Jane and I were at Bible College of New Zealand a long time ago now, 
it was multi-ethnic. People from all the islands were often there. And we were always surprised that many of our Fijian, Tongan, Samoan friends were no longer using their original Fijian names, but they had biblical names that had been given to them at their baptism. It was such a significant event in their conversion that they took on a new name to symbolize the new life that was coming their way. And it's important to remember that the name is connected to the life itself. If you like, it's a fulfillment of um, 2 Corinthians 5.17, that when we're in Christ, we are new creations. The old is gone and the new has come. And that name tends to recognize that shift and transition into a new way of being. It signifies, if you like, a break from what was and an entry into a new future, not only for us, but also for the generations to come beyond us. If you like, Jesus followed the same tradition too. He followed it with uh, Simon, who then becomes Peter. He's given a new name, Peter or Cephas, meaning rock, the rock upon which he would build his church, the rock of faith. It was an entry into a new way of being for Peter and a new way of seeing from his old traditional Hebrew roots into this new Greek world that he was going to find himself in, a rock for the new church, both Jew and Gentile. Sometimes he gave people nicknames. James and John he called the Sons of Thunder. You can kind of imagine them wearing lack leather jackets and riding Harley Davidsons. They were a couple of tough nuts in their own right. But Jesus referred to them in that way to define the difference that they would make in his kingdom and in this new mission that he was part of. Saul, the persecutor of the church, becomes Paul. He gives a Greek name to an old Hebrew name and it becomes the birther of the new church among the Gentiles. So really the question of Lent is what name do we live under? The name itself in terms of words or sounds isn't so important but it's the life that comes with the name that makes the biggest difference. What name do you live day by day under? If not a name per se, perhaps it's a better way of saying what story do we live day by day? How do we view our life in relation to being in Christ or the history from which we come from, whether it be good, bad, difficult or otherwise? These things shape the way we see ourselves day by day. The new name reflects a new story. So the question is this, what story do you tell? All of us have a story of life that we live, and our name may remind us of that story. But when we find ourselves in Christ and we are converted or transformed, the name now expresses a new story and a new way of viewing the old story. There are many ways of telling a series of accounts. All of us have accounts that have happened throughout our lives, but how we tell the account is determined on how we see ourselves and how we frame that viewing. Do we see ourselves through our history or do we see ourselves through the new creation of God in the present through the work of his spirit? So Lent becomes this time of reflection if you like. It's not necessarily about our failings or our weaknesses or our sins as often it's portrayed to be. But perhaps it's more appropriate to think about what kind of person am I becoming? Am I becoming the person that represents a new future with God and the transformation of Christ? Or am I becoming the same person I've always been, driven by my experience in time gone by? What sort of person do I want to be in Christ? Can I retell a new story and retell the old story as a story of grace and transformation and hope? because that's really what Lent's about. Reflection on ourselves and our relationship with Christ. Have we merely settled to be the people we've become, or are we asking God on a day-by-day -day basis to help us to become the people He has designed us to be, living in the image in which we are created, searching out a fullness of who we can be? Many years ago, I heard a great story about the Russian Revolution. It's probably fictional at one level, but it makes a good point. The story is called The Potato Digger's Daughter. The story goes that in the middle of the revolution, when many of the wealthy uh, lords of the time and princes and kings were being overthrown by the peasants in their revolt, there was one very wealthy royal family who had a daughter who was a princess. They had many children, in fact. 
On the day that the rev revolution came to their castle, the family took the daughter and told her to run into the woods because they knew that their own doom was coming and to save her was important for the generations to come. So this little girl tells the story of running and running into the woods as a very small four-year-old. And as she ran, eventually, the light from which she came became darkness as the surrounding forest enclosed her. Eventually, she fell down and she was tired and slept. When she awoke, she found herself in a very unusual bed. It wasn't a comfortable bed, it was more like a cot with some cotton that had been sewn into it as a form of a hammock with some hay. She realised that the people who had picked her up from the forest were peasant workers working deep in the woods and they grew potatoes. They looked after her because they knew that her family had been harmed and they grew, she grew in that family. As she grew, she learned to dig potatoes with the rest of them and as time went on, she realised that she was really a potato digger. One day when she was digging potatoes in the field at harvest time, an old woman came out from the trees and walked straight over to her in a stooped kind of way. And she went to her and she said to her, do you know who you are? And the girl looked up to her and she was now an, a teenager in her late years and she said, I'm a potato digger and I'm the daughter of a potato digger. And the old woman said, no, that is not who you are. You are the daughter of a king. And at that moment, she walked back into the forest and disappeared. The girl went and asked her family again what had happened and the story was recounted. She still went out and dug potatoes day by day because that was her lot. But suddenly everything had changed. No longer was she a potato digger's daughter. She was now a child of the king. It meant that she stood just a little bit straighter. She dug with a different enthusiasm because she understood finally who she was. So this Lent is a reflection on who are you. You might have a name and it might refer to your history, but in Christ we are all children of the King. We live differently because we know who we truly are. The story we now tell is a new story. And in this Lenten period, we reflect on the knowledge that we aren't just children of God in word, we are children of God by being. And that changes the way we see ourselves and the world in which we live and helps us to live with a greater sense of faith and hope for all that is yet to come. Think about your name, think about who you are, but think about those things in light of Christ and the name changes, the story changes, and we find ourselves with a new sense of light and hope. The old is gone, the new has come. May God bless you this Lent.